You can start, sir. We are able to see your screen. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. And I, I sort of anticipated I might get this technical challenge. No but issues. Okay, we'll go ahead. <laughs> All right. So as I said, we'll define diabetes and prediabetes and talk about the cardiovascular complications of prediabetes. And at the end of this presentation, I hope to convince you that it is important to identify and recognize prediabetes and intervene appropriately. So this is my favorite slide. This shows that diabetes is an ancient disease and the Indian physicians have been involved in the care of diabetes from ancient times and continue to make important contributions in this field all over the world, from India, US, and the rest of the countries. But here's a question. And the reason I ask you this question is because historically, some of the older physicians would remember that before 1979, there was no consensus as to how to make a diagnosis of diabetes. And you could go to Ann Arbor, and I practiced about 65 miles away from Ann Arbor, and be told that you have diabetes. And then you could move to Washington, DC, and be told that you don't have diabetes. The criteria that we use currently were developed in 1997. And these were based on epidemiological data, which showed that the numbers we now use to make a diagnosis of diabetes, at those points, the retinopathy took a big jump. And retinopathy was considered to be a specific marker for diabetes. So these are the criteria that we currently use for making a diagnosis of diabetes, and they're well established, and I'm not going to read those, but I will make two points. And that is that if you're going to use hemoglobin A1C for making a diagnosis of diabetes, then the test must be done in a standardized certified laboratory. And the second thing is that in the absence of unequivocal hyperglycemia, diagnosis of diabetes requires two abnormal tests from the same sample or two different samples. So with those diagnostic criteria, the current prevalence of diabetes all across the world is 463 million, which is expected to be increased to 700 million by 2045. And here's the prevalence of diabetes in the US and India. And somewhat surprisingly to me at least, one in six diabetics around the world is from India. And you can see that there are 77 million people estimated to have diabetes in, in India. Prediabetes, on the other hand, is characterized by hyperglycemia, which is defined by blood glucose levels that are higher than normal, but below the levels for a clinical diagnosis of diabetes. And here, there is some disagreement into what makes the diagnosis of prediabetes. For example, in paired fasting glucose, which is one of the criteria for making a diagnosis of diabetes, the American Diabetes Association criteria is 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter, whereas the WHO and IDF use 110 to 125. Similarly, for prediabetes, the hemoglobin A1C criteria for the American Diabetes Association is 5.7 to 6.4, whereas in the rest of the world, or WHO and IDF, it's six to 6.4. And I'll admit my ignorance here because I'm not sure what criteria are you folks using in India. And again, for the prevalence of prediabetes, almost 352 million adults were living with prediabetes worldwide in 2017. And again, this number is expected to increase to 587 million people by 2045. So you can see it's a huge problem. And the question is, is prediabetes associated with micro and macrovascular complications? And the answer to that is yes. And let me show you some data. And these are three studies that have looked at the relationship of fasting plasma glucose to retinopathy. And you can see there are fairly large numbers, 3,000, 2,000, and 6,000 in this US study. And there are two Australian studies. And what they found, if you look at the prevalence of retinopathy, with plasma glucose levels below seven, which is seven millimoles per liter, which is where we make a diagnosis of diabetes, you already have some degree of retinopathy. And as the levels of glucose go up, so does the retinopathy. Or if you look at the hemoglobin A1C levels, hemoglobin A1C levels below six 
again, you have some degree of retinopathy present. So if you look at it, the proportion of retinopathy in non-diabetic population with a plasma glucose level of less than 126, meaning all pre-diabetes, is somewhere between 7.4 to 13.4%. And in addition, there is a significant increase of hypertension amongst these folks. In the diabetes prevention program, again, at the onset, 5 to 7% of patients had retinopathy already, and it increased as they developed diabetes. And this is an old study, the DECODE study. If you look at impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance, and look at cardiovascular disease complications, coronary artery disease, stroke, or all-cause mortality, and you can see the impaired fasting glucose, impaired glucose tolerance test, there is already an increased cardiovascular death. This is a meta-analysis of the study. And again, if you look at the impaired fasting glucose, whether you define it by the ADA criteria or you define it by the idea for WHO criteria, or if you look at the hemoglobin A1C, the cardiovascular disease death, coronary artery disease death, all of these are significantly increased except for the relationship of hemoglobin A1C and stroke. Again, emphasizing that with large meta-analysis, large enough numbers, follow-up of approximately 10 years, there is a significant increase of cardiovascular complications and mortality. So if you look at the progression of non-diabetic individuals, people who don't have diabetes and have some genetic predisposition and some environmental factors may develop diabetes, but they go through this phase of pre-diabetes, which consists of impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance test. And if we don't intervene, they're going to progress to diabetes. I'm not gonna show you all the studies which have followed up patients with impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance test, but a few years ago, we calculated what was the rate of progression of pre-diabetes to diabetes. It was approximately 5% per year. And 70% of individuals eventually will develop diabetes. And about 3% of adults will revert to normal glycemia annually. So next question is, should we screen for pre-diabetes? And the answer to that is also yes, because we know that the epidemiological evidence suggests that complications begin early and progress as the hyperglycemia progresses. We now have effective interventions to prevent the disease progression. And these, therefore, prediabetes meets all the criteria for screening. And therefore, we should be screening for it. Now that we sort of looked at the, and the need for pre screening, let me present to you a case. This is a 45-year-old East Indian male who comes to your office because his brother was recently diagnosed to have diabetes. And he wants to know if he also has diabetes. He's five foot 10 inches tall, 180 pounds. The BMI is 26.1, the pulse is 66, the blood pressure is slightly elevated, and the rest of the exam is completely normal. So hemoglobin A1C was obtained in the clinic, a point of care measurement, and it was 6%. So now you'll inform him that he has prediabetes and he should begin treatment, mainly the lifestyle modification, or you would advise that another test for diabetes, a fasting glucose, glucose tolerance test, or a repeat hemoglobin A1C should be performed to establish a diagnosis. I'll let you think about it for a moment and then we'll come back at the end of the presentation. So the next question is, can we prevent the progression of prediabetes to diabetes? And the answer to that is yes. And these are several studies, which are randomized control studies, looking at lifestyle modifications to prevent the progression of pre-diabetes to diabetes. And we'll talk briefly about the diabetes prevention program and the Indian study. There are also multiple studies that have looked at the drugs as an, interfering, as an intervening means to prevent the progression of pre-diabetes to diabetes. Metformin, troglitazone, and carbol but we're not gonna talk much about it, mainly because of lack of time. So the diabetes prevention program was approximately 3000 patients, randomized to lifestyle intervention, which basically meant 150 minutes of exercise per week, metformin 850 milligrams twice a day, or placebo. And after nearly four years of follow-up, 
the patients who were assigned to the lifestyle intervention lost approximately 7% of their body weight, and there was a 58% risk reduction of, uh, of the progression of prediabetes to diabetes. And with the metformin, there was a 31% risk reduction. And so both of these were effective, but lifestyle in, was clearly more effective. In the Indian study, both the lifestyle modification and metformin had approximately 26 to 29% decrease. And then somewhat surprising, there was no additional benefit of adding metformin to the lifestyle modification. So done well, the lifestyle modification itself may be sufficient. And this is a more recent study which looked at the progression of prediabetes to diabetes. And interestingly enough, this is an international study. In the first phase, patients were assigned to a very low calorie diet of 800 calories and 2,200 subjects lost 8% of the body weight. And those that lost that weight were then randomized to the second phase for a high protein diet, which is 25% of the calories from protein, a moderate protein diet, which is 15% of calories from protein, and either a 75 minute high intensity exercise or 150 minute moderate exercise. And at the end of about three years, 62 patients out of the remaining 962 developed diabetes approximately a rate of 3%, whereas 21% would have been expected. And in the diabetes prevention long-term follow-up, which was another 10-year follow-up after the results I showed you earlier, up to 2013, again, the cumulative evidence of diabetes was significantly lower in the lifestyle, and then next is metformin, and of course, placebo, almost 50% of patients developed diabetes. So to summarize this data, the lifestyle modification basically consists of a weight loss of 7% by walking approximately 150 minutes per week, and that reduced the risk by about 58%, the range being 28 to 67%. And again, although we haven't talked about it in detail, many drugs, thiazolidinediones, metformin, alpha-glucosis inhibitors, they can also reduce the risk by about 25 to 60%. So let me ask you a question. Which of the following drugs are approved by the management of prediabetes to diabetes? And metformin, citagliptin, progridazone, all sulfonylureas, or none of the above? And you could respond in chat, but we may or may not have time for that. So let me give you the answer. At the present time, no pharmacological agents are currently approved by the FDA for management of prediabetes, although they can be used, but that use would be considered an off-label use. So let me talk about finally the management of, of prediabetes. I've already talked about the lifestyle modification indicating approximately five to 10%. The 7% number is quoted frequently because that was the number that patients in diabetes prevention program achieved. And then in addition, we should include the caloric restriction, increased fiber intake, and in some cases, limited carbohydrate intake. Pharmacotherapy can be targeted at glucose, which we considered high risk for patients with individual risk benefit analysis. And metformin therapy recently by the American Diabetes Association has been mentioned that this should be considered in those with prediabetes especially those with a BMI of more than 35, those aged less than 60 years, and women with prior gestational diabetes. The untreated diabetes individuals with prediabetes are at increased risk for diabetes as well as micro and macrovascular complications. And therefore, treatment goals are to prevent the deterioration in glucose levels and modify other risk factors such as obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia. The goals for management of, of blood pressure and lipids are the same as we have for diabetes. So even patients with prediabetes should have paid attention to blood pressure and lipid goals. So this is a study of national study of primary care physicians. And it's somewhat of a discouraging study, disappointing, but it is very understandable. To my way of thinking, I think the job of a primary care physician is the hardest job out of all the specialists and subspecialists. But be that as it may, 
In this particular study, only 50% of primary care physicians correctly identified the criteria for diabetes, which we have had since 1997. 42% of them correctly identified the fasting blood glucose criteria for pre-diabetes. Only 31% correctly identified the hemoglobin A1C criteria for pre-diabetes. And only 36% of the primary care physicians refer patients to a diabetes prevention program as their initial management. And only 43% discussed using or considering use of metformin for pediatrics. So the authors concluded that addressing the gaps in primary care physician knowledge may improve the identification and management of people with prediabetes, but there must be system level changes which are necessary to support the type 2 diabetes prevention in the primary care setting. So back to our case, this was a 45-year-old gentleman who is essentially asymptomatic. The vital signs are fine, blood pressure is slightly elevated. So he had a hemoglobin A1C down at 6%. So which of these answers was correct? The answer that is correct is that we should advise a second test because recall this hemoglobin A1C was done in the point of care, which is in the clinic, and it is not a certified laboratory test by the hemoglobin A1C. So a repeat fasting blood glucose was obtained and which is 105 milligrams per deciliter, which now meets the criteria according to the ADA for prediabetes. And therefore, he should begin lifestyle modification, which will be a combination of diet and exercise to approximately 30 minutes, five days a week, or 150 minutes a weekly. And to my mind, it's somewhat controversial whether you want to add metformin at this point or not. Although the ADA now says that he meets the criteria of being less than age 60, the Indian study of, of lifestyle and which added metformin did not show an additional benefit. So I probably would put him on a lifestyle modification, try it up for three months or maybe even six months. And if that's not showing any significant effect, I would add metformin. But I understand that many of you may have uh, other opinions and I would love to have those as we talk about the question and answer sessions. And there are approximately two minutes that are left. So again, thank you very much for your time and your attention. And I'll be happy to have any questions or discussions.